John, I remember distinctly uh, reading both of your books on the philosophy of, uh, of cosmology and just being, really having my whole way of thinking changed by that and uh, uh, asking uh, in terms of the physics and the cosmology of the universe, uh, is there a reason? Is there, what, how, can you, how can you push it without, without falling into uh, a traditional religious or, or, or views? Um, I know you believe that there is a reason for the cosmos, uh, which I am not uh, as, uh, as convinced of, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm your student and I'm willing to listen. Well, I think the universe exists because it ought to exist. Because its existence is uh, ethically required. Or, if you want to have a more neutral word, it's axiologically required, where that means it's a requirement of worth is behind the existence of the universe. And uh, I, I take this to be a very traditional view. It goes back all the way to Plato. It has been developed by countless believers in God who thinks that God's existence is behind the universe and God's existence is itself a matter of value. Now that's a significant point because what you're saying are people who believe in God, who talk about God, say that not just God is good, but that the essence of God is good such that God exists. I mean, that's a big difference. Yeah, that's a big difference. And it's a big difference because you can't move by simple logic from the fact that the existence of something would be required from the point of view of worth to the fact that that thing actually exists. Mm. But what people have been impressed by is that you can't prove that it's wrong to say that the existence of something is due to the requirement, the ethical requirement, that it e exist. Whereas I think you, you could say it's, it's obviously wrong to say that the existence of a red thing is due to its being red. There's no sort of explanation there. Yeah. The idea of uh, value is the idea of being marked out for existence, of existence being demanded in some way. And once you have the idea of existence being demanded, it's, it's very hard to show that there's a contradiction in supposing that that demandedness of existence has actually produced a universe. What you'd try to do if you wanted to oppose this idea is to say that the demands of value simply aren't satisfied in our universe, that our universe is too dreadful a place, there are too many tragedies. All right, look, I, I begin to understand what you're saying. Uh, first of all, give me a sense of, of the philosophers or thinkers in the past who have had similar views. Well, Plato, you could say, started it all. Uh, Aristotle seems to have thought that God existed because of God's goodness. You have um, Plotinus, who is a major philosopher, who says that uh, God just is a force of value. God is not a being at all. Mm. And this seems actually to better reflect the views of Plato than Aristotle does. You have in Aristotle a divine mind which exists because it's good. But in Plotinus, there is no divine mind. You have a creative force of value which produces the sorts of things which a good mind would. And then later on, you have uh, people like St. Anselm and Aquinas who see goodness as somehow behind the universe. In the case of Anselm, there's the argument that um, God's perfection involves necessary existence because a thing couldn't be perfect unless it had this particular property. Uh, you have Aquinas obscurely suggesting that um, God is pure being and that the essence, pure being is essentially good. And I take this to be more of the same 
more of the same sort of thing. Okay, so so it's not just your idiosyncratic view. It has no, I, long... I, I wish it were, <laughs> in a way. Um, because I, I, I had this uh, idea at uh, age 17. Uh, suddenly it, it clicked that value is a reason for existence and... Um, Maybe that's the reason why the universe existed. And then I found to my disgust that this guy, Plato, had got it almost two and a half thousand years ago. And there was this long string of philosophers following on through people like Descartes and Leibniz and Hegel and um, Alfred Ewing, who you probably haven't heard of, but is a, a major British philosopher, all, all saying the same sort of thing. Okay. All right. I mean, let's proceed because there are some real problems. The first one is that um, what is it about value that would give it some pre-absolute existence? Many people think value is relative. It's how it's a human construction that we that we uh, that that is brought up because of our own personalities or social setting, and uh, it's it, 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 there's nothing uh, absolute in it at all. Well, I tend to think of those people as denying value. I think they say that the world is essentially worthless, but that we're keen on various things. And I think that when they use words like value, they are grabbing words which don't belong to them. <laughs> now, this is a very controversial reaction to a large number of modern philosophers of ethics. But I, I think, in effect, they, they don't think that anything is better than anything else. Right. Uh, okay, I mean, you, you have to deal with that. The next thing you have to deal with, which is perhaps the biggest problem, is that value at at best, at best, is what we call an abstract object, and and abstract objects uh, have almost by definition have no causal impact. So, how does value create a universe? Just like how could the number six create a universe? Well, the number six couldn't create a universe because the number six isn't in any way directed towards anything. Uh, value is a case of being marked out for existence. So there's that sort of distinction. I, I, I'd like to challenge this idea that uh, abstractions can't have any influence. Suppose you look at the number of different ways a, a coin could land. You, you toss 10 coins, you could get 10 heads, or you might get just one head and nine tails. It's ten times more likely that you'll get one head and nine tails than you than you get ten heads. How are you going to prove this without bringing in abstract facts? Abstract facts about distributions of possibilities, which are the basics of uh, calculations in probability theory. These have an influence on the world. Abstract facts of mathematics help bridges to stand upright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you get your calculations wrong, your bridge is going to collapse. Uh, this general statement that uh, abstractions have no influence on the actual world, uh, I think is completely wrong. It has been challenged recently by a very good mathematical physicist, Roger Penrose, who thinks that it's, it's obvious that the platonic realm, as he puts it, of abstractions is constantly influencing the world. John, all I can say is um, uh, you've been doing this since you're 17. Um, suppose you're wrong. Well, the great thing is that it, it can't be shown that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what I've tried to do is to bring up to date a number of arguments which have been around for almost two and a half thousand years. And uh, I've tried to show that they can be defended. So this long round of thinkers, uh, they're not absolute idiots, because if they were, I, I would be one too. <laughs> <laughs>